Well, thank you, KC, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you indeed to KC and the organizers for uh, providing me with this opportunity to speak here today. So today I'm going to be speaking to you about lignin deconstruction uh, for the production of fuels and hopefully chemicals. Uh, just to give you an idea of the structure of my talk, I'll start with a few words concerning lignin, what it is, and why we think it's important to utilize it. I'll then go on to consider our approach to lignin utilization, focusing on three main areas, namely in-planter lignin modification, lignin dissolution in ionic liquids, and finally, I'll consider some results concerning the oxidative cleavage of lignin and lignin model compounds. And then I'll finish with a brief summary. Well, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, plant matter consists of three main biopolymers, namely lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. And the lignin component typically accounts for about 15 to 30 weight percent of plant matter. Now, the role of lignin is principally to fill the spaces in the plant cell wall between the cellulose and hemicellulose. In fact, it's covalently bonded to the hemicellulose and cross-links with it, thereby providing the cell wall with mechanical strength, with rigidity, and by extension, providing strength to the uh, whole plant. Now, lignin itself is an amorphous three-dimensional polymer, and as shown here, I can find the clicker, or the uh, pointer. It consists of three main monomers, synapyl alcohol, coniferyl alcohol, and cumaryl alcohol. And as you see from this idealized representation of the lignin structure, lignin is highly aromatic in character. And this gives rise to the idea that if we could reductively depolymerize or deconstruct lignin, we would ha have access to a range of aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, such as toluene, xylenes, etc. And of course, these are very important platform chemicals for the chemical industry, since they can be used to synthesize a wide range of aromatic derivatives. Of course, currently, these, uh, these aromatic building blocks are obtained from petroleum crude. So if we can utilize lignin for this purpose, then we would uh, be effectively replacing part of the petroleum crude that is currently consumed. Additionally, if we could find non-reductive ways of depolymerizing lignin, then we would have direct access to a number of oxygenated aromatic derivatives. Uh, well, the pointer doesn't seem to be cooperating, but these are shown, ah, there we go. These are shown at the bottom of the slide. And these themselves could function as ready precursors for the production of value-added bioproducts, such as polymers, resins, dyes, etc. And this gives rise to the idea that if we can utilize lignin for the production of these bioproducts, we would have a means of greatly increasing revenues from biorefineries. And indeed, Zhang, in a 2008 analysis, showed that complete utilization of the uh, lignin component of the biomass feedstock could enable biomass uh, or, or biorefinery revenues to be greatly increased. So this slide summarizes our approach towards lignin utilization. And as you see, there are a number of strategies involved. The first of these concerns in-planter lignin modification. few readjustments here. There we go. So this is work being led by my colleague from the UK Horticulture Department, Dr. Seth DeBolt. And the focus here is really twofold. First of all, we want to increase the lignin content of plant matter. Now this obviously contradicts um, something that you heard this morning. Uh, if we increase the lignin content, it's going to make it harder to break down the plant you may think, but at the same time, of course, if we increase lignin content, we also increase the energy density of the biomass because, of course, lignin is the most energy dense of the three main biopolymers. 
Additionally, we would also like to use this implant and modification of the lignin to alter the lignin structure and composition so as to, fis so as to facilitate, facilitate downstream processing. Now, the second main strategy that we've adopted is to extract lignin from the biomass using ionic liquids. And this is work being conducted by my colleague, Dr. Sam Morton of uh, James Madison University. And then the, uh, the third plank in our overall strategy is to utilize catalytic approaches for the oxidative cleavage of lignin. And this is work being conducted by my colleague in the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Mark Meyer, in collaboration with my research group. Additionally, we could also consider the catalytic upgrading of lignin-derived oxygenates uh, by means of, for example, hydrodeoxygenation to obtain aromatic hydrocarbons, which could be used for fuel blending purposes. But that's not something that I'll be talking about today. So let's begin with a consideration of in-planter lignin modification. Now, Seth is currently looking at a couple of different strategies here, and one of these concerns the application of endophyte secretions to bioenergy crops, and in particular, bioenergy grasses. Now, endophytes are endosymbionts. That's to say, they live within a plant in a symbiotic relationship. But not a great deal is known about these endophytes or the nature of the interaction with the plant. Suffice to say, it is known that these endophytes secrete certain chemicals, which in some cases can alter plant biology. So Seth began by looking at the endophytes associated with switchgrass, and in fact, he was able to uh, isolate and identify over 1,000 different fungal and bacterial endophytes, and these were characterized according to their genetic makeup. Subsequently, the uh, secretions were extracted from these endophytes. They were added to sterile plant growth media, and these, this media was then used for the cultivation of, in this case, a model plant, Arabidopsis. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see uh, two images. The top one is for uh, part of an Arabidopsis leaf and uh, stem. And the bottom case corresponds to the same material, but in this case, the Arabidopsis has been treated with one of these endophyte secretions. And in both cases, a dye has been added to the, uh, end, uh, the Arabidopsis sample, which changes color, which changes color to red, in the presence of lignin. And you can clearly see that the Arabidopsis sample, which has been treated with the endophyte secretion, has ectopic lignin present. That's to say lignin present in both the leaf stem and to a certain degree the leaf itself. So this approach clearly works. Another approach that uh, Seth DeBolt has been looking at concerns the application of forward genetics to bioenergy crops, and in this case, sweet sorghum. Now, of course, sorghum is of interest because the stems contain elevated levels of sugar, which can be converted to uh, uh, bioethanol, for example, or indeed biobutanol. But right now, we don't really have a good use for the leaves. So this made us think, well, perhaps we can increase the level of lignin and other phenolic compounds present in the leaves. And then we could either use them uh, as a, uh, a bio-based fuel, or we could perhaps extract the phenolic compounds and use them for the production of, of value-added chemicals or other bioproducts. So Seth began by exposing uh, sorghum seeds uh, to mutagenesis, and the resulting mutants were selected based on elevated levels of phenolic compounds in the leaves. And I'm thinking not just lignin here, but also other phenolic compounds such as anthocyanins. And if you look at the seedlings shown in the, the bottom left-hand photo, it's apparent that some of these seedlings display red-colored leaves. And these this is due to the fact that we have elevated levels of both lignin and also anthocyanins present. And if you look at the photos to the right, you can see mature plants, and again, these are characterized by these red-colored leaves. In fact, Seth likes to, to call this particular mutant the red giant. So we've gone on to characterize the phenolic compounds present in the leaves of this mutant sorghum. And shown here are the results of pyrolysis GCMS analysis 
performed on both the, the mutant leaf and also on a wild sorghum leaf. Pyrolysis GCMS is simply uh, analytical scale pyrolysis in which we use an online GCMS to characterize the pyrolysis vapors, i.e. the compounds that are formed during the thermal decomposition of the biomass. Now, if you look at the chromatogram shown at the top, this corresponds to the wild sorghum leaf. You can see that we have a great number of compounds eluting. Those eluting at shorter retention times correspond to uh, compounds which are derived from the decomposition of the hemicellulose and cellulose present in the uh, plant matter. The compounds eluting at longer retention times correspond to aromatics, and of course, these are derived from the uh, lignin and other phenolic compounds present in the leaf. And if you look at the two chromatograms, then you can see subtle differences between the product distributions for the wild sorghum leaf and the mutant sorghum leaf. Indeed, if you look at the table below, we can sum up the total area percents for the lignin-derived compounds and we find that the value obtained for the mutant leaf is significantly higher than that for the wild type leaf. So this is consistent with the fact that we have elevated amounts of phenolic compounds present in the leaf. Furthermore, we can obtain information from these chromatograms about the relative proportion of the different monomers present in the lignin. In this case, we're looking at the S to G ratio, i.e. the ratio of sinapyl to guaiacyl monomers. And you can see that this ratio is higher for the mutant than the wild type leaf. And this is quite encouraging because a high S to G ratio typically corresponds to a more open type of lignin structure, which should be more amenable to chemical attack and chemical degradation. So I've shown you that we can, to some degree, alter lignin content in plants and also its structure and composition. So now the next thing we need to do is find ways of extracting the lignin from plant matter. And to this end, we've been looking at a class of solvents called ionic liquids. Um, and these are simply ionic compounds that are liquid at or near room temperature. Imidazolium-based ionic liquids have been uh, quite widely studied of late, um, particularly in connection with uh, biomass processing. But we were specifically interested in a, uh, a, a class of ionic liquids which can best be described as dialkyl imidazolium halides. Uh, in particular, we were interested in varying the length of the two alkyl groups present. These hadn't previously been studied uh, to any significant degree. So here you see the results of lignin dissolution experiments performed at 100 degrees C using a variety of ionic liquids in which we've systematically increased the chain length of these alkyl methyl imidazolium chlorides. And what I'm showing you here are micrographs, optical micrographs, taken with a microscope equipped with a heated stage. Now, if you look at the results corresponding to T equals zero minutes, then you can see that basically we have a suspension of lignin particles present in the ionic liquid. In the case of the butyl derivative, as we uh, uh, let the experiment run, then we see that after 30 minutes, all of the lignin has dissolved. As we increase the alkyl chain length, then so the lignin solubility tends to decrease. However, even in the case of, for example, the octal and decyl derivatives, after 60 minutes, we can still get complete lignin dissolution. And we can do the same type of experiment with cellulose and hemicellulose. In the case of cellulose, we find that it's not as soluble. However, we can obtain pretty much complete cellulose dissolution in the butyl derivative after about 60 minutes. However, as we increase the chain length, then again, the cellulose solubility tends to decrease, such that for the octal decyl and dodecyl uh, derivatives, the cellulose is completely insoluble. And we obtain somewhat similar results for hemicellulose. So now we have a means of effectively fractionating our biomass. For example, if we start with the dodecyl derivative, you can see that it will dissolve lignin, but not the cellulose or hemicellulose. Whereas if we go to, for example, the decyl derivative, it will dissolve both lignin and hemicellulose. 
And if we go to the shorter chain variants, e.g. butyl or hexyl, then we can dissolve the whole biomass. So the question is, can we go on now and try and oxidatively depolymerize or deconstruct our lignin? Now at this juncture, I need to say a few words about the uh, linkages present in lignin, uh, the most important of which are shown on this slide. And you can see that by far and away, the most important linkage is the beta O4 linkage. This accounts for something like 50 to 60% of all the linkages present in lignin. And therefore, any strategy which is aimed at depolymerizing lignin really has to focus on the cleavage of this particular linkage. So here you see our approach for lignin deconstruction. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see an idealized fraction of the lignin macromolecule. And there are actually three uh, beta O4 linkages here. And I'm going to try and get the pointer to work uh, here, although it wasn't working very well before. No, it's not going to work. OK. Well, I'm actually going to walk over. So what I'd like you to look at is the alpha carbon here and the second beta carbon there. And you can see that the alpha carbon bears an OH group. So we have a benzylic alcohol group here. So what we can do is we can oxidize this benzylic alcohol, and we can form the corresponding ketone. And that's shown in the uh, central uh, structure there. We can then take that ketone and we can subject it to biovilliger oxidation. And in so doing, we insert an oxygen into the carbon alpha to carbon uh, beta bond. Effectively, what we've done here is to make an ester. And of course, we all know that esters can be readily cleaved in the presence of water. Uh, that's to say they can be subjected to hydrolysis, uh, providing we have water present and a catalytic amount of acid or base. And in so doing, of course, we'll obtain the corresponding carboxylic acid and the alcohol. So effectively, we will have cleaved or chopped up our lignin into smaller fragments. Well, we started by using some very simple model compounds with the goal of optimizing both the reagents and the conditions required for these transformations. So in this case, you can see that we started with phenylmethyl carbonyl. And we found that a nickel aluminum catalyst is uh, excellent for this particular transformation when used in conjunction with just molecular oxygen. And as you see, we can obtain the corresponding uh, ketone, in this case, acetophenone. And in turn, we can subject the acetophenone to biovilliger oxidation using simply metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, MCPBA, and we obtain the expected biovilliger oxidation product, in this case, phenyl acetate. We also wanted to work with compounds which directly model the beta O4 linkage in lignin, and so we prepared uh, a number of compounds as shown here. And the ones that I'm going to be uh, talking about today uh, bear an OH group at the R3 position. Well, we found that for these compounds, our nickel aluminum catalyst didn't do quite such a good job of oxidizing the uh, uh, benzylic alcohol group. However, another catalyst, in this case an organic catalyst, Tempo, uh, works very well for this particular transformation when used in conjunction with sodium nitrite as a co-catalyst and again using molecular oxygen as the oxidant. And you can see that in many cases we obtain excellent yields of the corresponding ketone. So then we have to do the biovilica oxidation. Again, we find that MCPBA is uh, an excellent reagent uh, for affecting this transformation. Additionally, we can use something like 30% uh, um, hydrogen peroxide in the presence of formic acid, which of course generates the per acid in situ. In this case, the reaction doesn't tend to stop at the ester because we have both water present and acid. Uh, we actually cleave the ester that's formed and we obtain the expected hydrolysis products, i.e. the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. So the question is, 
can we apply this methodology to lignin? And the short answer to that is we don't really know yet. Nonetheless, I'm going to show you some preliminary data anyway. So here you see results, uh, specifically gel permeation chromatography analyses of lignin product mixtures. Now, one general point that I should make here is that longer retention times correspond to lower molecular weights. So if you look at the trace at the top, that corresponds to the chromatogram for metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, which of course contains one benzene ring. Below it is the chromatogram we obtain for one of our beta O4 model compounds, which contains two benzene ring, rings, i.e. it's essentially a dimer. And because it has a slightly higher molecular weight, it elutes a little bit earlier than the MCPBA. Now, if you turn your attention to the chromatogram at the bottom of the slide in blue, this corresponds to our organosol lignin starting material. So what we do is we subject this to the benzylic oxidation reaction, and that gives us a material which possesses the chromatogram shown in dark red. And you see that the molecular weight distribution of the lignin hasn't really changed. And indeed, you wouldn't expect it to. All, we, all we've done at this stage is a benzylic oxidation. However, if we take that material and we subject it then to biovilliger oxidation, followed by, in this case, transesterification with methanol rather than simple hydrolysis. And the reason for that was we wanted to, to make a methyl ester of the carboxylic acid rather than the carboxylic acid itself, because we thought the methyl ester would be uh, easier to analyze. Now, if you look at the, the position of the, the main peak in that chromatogram, shown in green, you can see that it corresponds to the region roughly between the uh, MCPBA and our beta O4 model compound. In other words, we think that we've made mainly monomers and dimers. Now, we can analyze this material by GCMS, and if we do that, then we do indeed find three monomers present. Uh, from left to right, the structures shown there are a syringol, a vanillin, and syringaldehyde. However, these are relatively minor oxidation products, and indeed, they're not the main products you would expect from this sequence of oxidation reactions. So what we think is happening here is that the monomers and dimers that we're forming are not really amenable to GCMS analysis simply because the molecular weights are too high, i.e. they're not sufficiently volatile. So for that reason, we're currently analyzing this material using liquid chromatography in conjunction with mass spectrometry. However, I'm afraid I don't have any results for you today. So the jury is still open on that one. However, it clearly looks like we're doing something to the lignin and we seem to be decreasing its average molecular weight. So with that, um, I will finish with a, a brief uh, overview. I've shown you that in-plant approaches can be successfully applied, both to increase uh, the lignin and indeed the phenolic content in, uh, in plants. And furthermore, mutations, in this case in sorghum, clearly result in changes in lignin structure and composition. Ionic liquids have been developed which permit the selective oxidation of lignin in biomass. And I've shown you that a sequence of oxidation reactions, namely benzylic alcohol oxidation, followed by biovilliger oxidation, can be used to successfully cleave beta O4 model compounds. And of course, we're currently applying this methodology to lignin. Uh, a final word, um, I think it's fair to say that efforts to manipulate the structure of lignin and to affect its deconstruction are really still in a very early uh, still in a very early stage, not only within our group, but also uh, in the field as a whole. So it will be very interesting to see how it uh, evolves in the next few years. So with that, it just remains for me to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this work and our program manager at NSF, Dr. George Antos. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge the contributions of my co-authors, uh, Rodney Andrews, Seth DeBolt, Mark Meyer, and Samuel Morton. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank the students, postdocs, and staff who've done the real work on this project, and their names are shown here. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes.
Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a couple questions. First, can you comment on the ionic liquid stability to your uh, harsh oxidizing conditions uh, there? Uh, and then how does this work compare to the work done by Dr. Robin Rogers at Alabama? Uh, they do some cellulose dissolution as well with uh, sort of imidazolium-based ionic liquids. Thank you. Right, okay, so I'll take the second part first. Um, I, I'm reasonably familiar with Ro Robin Rogers' work. Um, he's tended to focus mainly on cellulose dissolution, as you rightly say. Uh, we're really trying to focus on lignin dissolution. Um, what I would say is that uh, certainly his published work has tended to focus on, um, as well as midazolium compounds, a, a range of other ionic liquids. But to my knowledge, he hasn't really looked at these longer chain dialkyl and midazolium uh, halides. And that was, in fact, the re one of the reasons we chose to look at them, simply because they hadn't been explored. Um, with respect to the, the first part, um, Actually, most of the chemistry that I showed you wasn't done in ionic liquids, simply because we've been doing the ionic liquid work in parallel with the chemistry. So um, typically for the lignin reactions and the model compound reactions, we've been using other solvents in which our lignin is soluble. Um, typically, something like diphenyl ether or 1,2-dichloroethane. Uh, for instance, and they show uh, pretty good stability. Certainly the 1,2-dichloroethane shows excellent stability. Um, obviously, we can't do lignin extractions using those solvents because although lignin is somewhat soluble in them, it, it's nowhere near soluble enough to actually be able to do sort of preparatory scale lignin extractions. Um, so yeah, it will be very interesting to see what the um, stability, oxidative stability of these um, ionic liquids is like. I would say that a fair amount of, of um, literature has been published concerning oxidation reactions performed in um, other imidazolium based ionic liquids. Um, Beamin chloride, for instance, is, is you know, the classic ionic liquid which is used for, for a great deal of uh, oxidation reactions. And generally speaking, it shows excellent stability. So we don't think the stability of our compounds will be significantly different. Good afternoon, Mark J.R. Riggleboot of South Carolina. I recognize the EFRI program there. Um, are you looking, uh, you, you've shown very nicely uh, how the ionic liquids affects the solubility. Would that, uh, would the same sorts of ionic liquids also affect the reactivity? Have you, have you looked for deconstruction in those solvents? No, we haven't. We're just starting to do that work now. Um, so I wish I had an answer for you, but I'm, I'm afraid I just don't. Other questions? One up here. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, what's the percentage of the dissolution of lignin in your ionic liquid? In the ionic liquid? As mm. for cellulose, I think it's about 25%. Uh, so how is it for lignin? 25% um, by weight? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's high. Uh, whether we're getting to 25 weight percent, the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Certainly 15, 20 weight percent, I think we can get to. It may be higher, but I'd have to check with my colleague, Dr. Samuel Morton. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Crocker.